A tense situation was unfolding in the remote and rugged terrain of northwestern Badakhshan, close to the Tajikistan border. Four courageous aid workers were held captive in a cave, shrouded by the dense Koelaram forest in the Shahri Buzurg district. Their abduction had occurred six days prior during a risky journey on horseback from Yafta to Yavan by a group with alarming ties to the Taliban. This began an extraordinary and covert SAS rescue operation that would unfold under the shroud of secrecy and become a story of incredible bravery and strategic mastery, yet remained largely untold. Let's take a moment to understand who these aid workers were, bringing into focus the human element of this harrowing situation. Among the hostages were two British nationals, one Kenyan and one Afghan. The British hostages included Emma Johnston, a 28-year-old nurse from Manchester with a passion for humanitarian work, and James McAllister, a 32-year-old engineer from Leeds who had dedicated his career to developing sustainable water sources in Remote Areas. Moragua Oirere, a 26-year-old Kenyan teacher known for educating young girls in conflict zones, was accompanying them. The Afghan member of the group was Farid Ahmed, a 40-year-old local who had been working as a translator and logistics coordinator for various NGOs. The group was known for its commitment to aiding communities affected by war, focusing on providing health care, education, and basic infrastructure. Their journey to Yavan was part of a broader initiative to assess the needs of remote villages in the region. However, their noble mission was abruptly halted by a group of kidnappers with complex and dangerous ties. These kidnappers were part of a local criminal network known for their involvement in opium smuggling and other illicit activities. While they operated independently, they had established connections with the Taliban, often collaborating in exchange for protection or financial gain. Their motivation for this abduction was a substantial ransom and political leverage. By targeting foreign aid workers, they aimed to destabilize the already fragile security situation in the region and exert pressure on both local and international governments. Back in Kabul, this crisis had drawn the attention of the elite SAS and Afghan national defense. In a high-tech surveillance operation, they monitored the kidnappers' every move through live feeds from Predator drones. This wasn't just about keeping eyes on the kidnappers, it was a strategic play in crafting a daring rescue. At this juncture, it's crucial to delve into the technological and tactical aspects instrumental in the operation's success. The Predator drones, key assets in the mission, were equipped with cutting-edge surveillance technology. These unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, provided real-time, high-resolution imagery enabling the forces to track kidnapper movements and analyze their patterns. The drones were also equipped with thermal imaging cameras, crucial for night surveillance and detecting heat signatures in the dense forest. The special forces also employed satellite communications for secure, uninterrupted communication and GPS for precise location tracking. This technology was vital in coordinating the movements of the ground teams and ensuring they remained undetected. Tactically, the teams were prepared for the challenges posed by the Koe Laram forest. They underwent rigorous training specific to this terrain, focusing on stealth movement, quick adaptation to changing environments, and silent communication methods. The forces were also equipped with lightweight gear optimized for agility and speed, essential in navigating the dense foliage and rugged mountainous landscape. Moreover, the teams utilized a technique known as silent insertion, approaching the target area via Blackhawks, but landing at a considerable distance to avoid detection. This approach was coupled with a carefully planned route through the forest, mapped out using the intelligence gathered from drone surveillance. The route minimized exposure and maximized cover, a key factor in the success of their stealthy approach to the kidnappers' camp. The combination of advanced technology and specialized tactics tailored to the challenging terrain was a testament to the meticulous planning and adaptability of the SAS and U.S. Navy SEALs. This synergy of tech and tactics provided them with a tactical advantage. 
it significantly increased the chances of a successful rescue operation. In the heart of Kabul, the rescue plan was taking shape within the Joint Special Forces Group headquarters. This operation was a delicate balance of timing, strategy, and bravery. It was a race against time, with the lives of four brave women hanging in the balance. On the evening of May 28th, a formidable assembly of special forces was in place. A team of 28 SAS operatives, matched by an equal number of U.S. Navy SEALs, set up a forward operating base near Faizbad. This strategic location was just a 30-minute flight from where the hostages were held, deep in the Koh Laram forest. As these preparations were underway, a tense negotiation phase began. The Afghan government found itself entangled in talks with the kidnappers, who demanded a hefty $6 million ransom and the release of an associate. Despite the demands, the dialogue initially seemed constructive. However, there was an underlying alarm. The kidnappers were in contact with the Taliban, raising fears of a possible escalation. While diplomatic efforts continued, the special forces prepared for all eventualities. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, they didn't rely solely on the talks. Instead, they started a critical reconnaissance mission. The goal? Identifying potential helicopter landing sites in the challenging terrain. A mix of rugged mountains and dense forest. This meticulous planning highlighted the complexities of the mission as the teams navigated a landscape as unpredictable as the situation itself. A hidden danger lurked in the Badakhshan region, primarily inhabited by farmers and shepherds. Despite limited insurgent activity, the area was known for criminal networks, particularly for opium smuggling into Tajikistan and Russia. This backdrop added complexity to the rescue operation in this strategically important but challenging terrain. Timing was everything in this high-stakes mission. A premature rescue attempt risked the hostages being executed. Conversely, any delay increased the risk of the women disappearing, potentially leading to their appearance in execution videos by extremist groups like Al-Qaeda. This T-Trope of Timing was crucial for the special forces to navigate. Simultaneously, the operation was under intense scrutiny at the highest government levels in London. The Prime Minister convened several urgent COBRA meetings, named after the Cabinet Office Briefing Room A. These gatherings were pivotal, keeping the UK's senior cabinet members abreast of the evolving situation. The involvement of the British government at this level underscored the operation's international significance and the gravity of the situation. As the SAS and US forces meticulously planned and rehearsed their operation in Afghanistan, these parallel efforts in London reflected the global coordination and urgency required for the mission's success. This coordination was vital for what was shaping into one of the most daring hostage rescues in recent history. The high-level COBRA meeting in London saw a gathering of the UK's top security and defense leaders. The heads of MI5 and MI6 were in attendance. The Director of Special Forces, General Sir David Richards, Chief of the Defense Staff, Tim Allen, National Security Advisor Sir Kim Daroch, and Defense Secretary Philip Hammond. In this critical meeting, the Prime Minister gave his green light for the rescue mission, entrusting its execution to Komisaf, led by General John Allen. The decision was clear, but the timing and method of the operation were still to be determined, adding to the mission's suspense. Meanwhile, on the ground, a significant breakthrough occurred. The Predator drone, a key asset in the operation, provided crucial intelligence. It revealed that two of the hostages, Miss Johnston, 28, and her colleague, 26-year-old Moragua Oirere, were being held separately from their Afghan counterparts in a different cave. This new information was pivotal, shaping the rescue strategy and adding urgency to the mission. It highlighted the dynamic nature of the situation, demanding quick adaptation and precise execution from the special forces involved. Intelligence gathered in Kabul intensified the mission's urgency. An intercepted call revealed the Taliban urged the kidnappers to make a public declaration of their intentions, a move interpreted as a potential threat to the hostages' lives. 
This development marked a critical turning point for the American Special Forces, signaling the need for immediate executive action. During the intense 12th COBRA meeting in London, chaired by Prime Minister David Cameron, key figures were briefed about the escalating situation and the imminent launch of the rescue operation. The details were sparse, but the message was clear. Action was imminent. Meanwhile, a strategic decision was made in Kabul to divide the rescue team. A group of 28 SAS operatives was assigned to rescue Miss Johnston and her Kenyan colleague. Concurrently, the formidable SEAL Team 6, renowned for their operation against Osama bin Laden, was tasked with the liberation of the Afghan hostages. This split strategy was crucial, allowing for a more focused and effective rescue effort tailored to the different locations and conditions of the two groups of hostages. The stakes were high, and the memories of past failures lingered, especially recalling the tragic fate of Linda Norgrove, a British doctor lost in a previous rescue attempt. A source emphasized the critical need for precision this time, acknowledging the weight of past lessons. Intelligence reports, though not entirely clear, indicated a significant threat. At least four kidnappers were believed to be guarding Miss Johnston and Miss Oerer. Another group of seven was overseeing the two Afghan hostages. All were heavily armed, equipped with AK-47s, rocket-propelled grenades, and a PKM machine gun capable of downing a helicopter. This formidable arsenal underscored the danger of the mission. As the operation neared its commencement, the British and US teams received the final go-ahead late Friday morning. The objective was unambiguous, rescue the hostages and neutralize the kidnappers. The critical moment, H hour, was set for 5 p.m. local time. This was the moment where training, strategy, and courage had to converge in a decisive, synchronized effort to ensure the success of this critical mission. The operation kicked into high gear as the rescue force, comprising elite SAS troops and their U.S. counterparts, embarked on their critical mission. They boarded MH-60L Black Hawk helicopters, expertly piloted by the renowned 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, also known as the Night Stalkers. These Black Hawks, armed with M230 chain guns and rocket pods, were a formidable force in the air. Two U.S. Apache helicopters accompanied them, providing additional support and crucial flank support. This aerial convoy was not just a transportation unit, but an integral part of the operation's firepower and strategic planning. The SAS soldiers, prepared for rapid and efficient combat, were equipped for a lightweight yet effective assault. Dressed in tactical black, they carried an arsenal consisting of machine guns, pistols, knives, and a variety of grenades. Each trooper was also equipped with night vision goggles and helmet-mounted cameras, ensuring operational effectiveness in the challenging conditions of the Koe Laram forest. As the operation intensified, the first group of Special Forces troops swiftly secured a helicopter landing site, HLS, atop a rocky valley. This strategic site, situated about two miles from the kidnappers' camp, was chosen for its proximity, yet concealed by the dense forest, which they hoped would muffle the sound of the approaching Blackhawks. With all troops successfully landing, the SAS and U.S. Navy SEALs began their stealthy approach towards the caves. The dense forest provided cover as they moved closer to where the hostages were held, with each step increasing the operation's intensity. Meanwhile, the operation was under close observation at the ISAF headquarters in Kabul. General John Allen, the commander, and his British deputy, Lieutenant General Adrian Bradshaw, were stationed in the main operations room, their eyes fixed on a bank of television screens. These screens gave them a live feed of the operation, ensuring they had complete situational awareness. This setup was crucial for real-time decision-making and support, keeping the command fully informed as the rescue mission unfolded in the fading evening light. As dusk settled, 
The British SAS troops neared the cave believed to house Miss Johnston and Miss Orer. They paused, coordinating their positions with the U.S. forces to ensure a simultaneous assault. This coordination was critical for the success of the mission. Final checks were made. Weapons, radios, night vision goggles, everything needed to be perfect. The order to assault was given. The special forces teams advanced in the dimming light, seamlessly blending into the shadows. Their approach was silent but deadly, utilizing silenced weapons to neutralize the kidnappers. Precision was key and several kidnappers were swiftly eliminated using the double-tap technique, two quick, accurately placed shots to ensure incapacitation. This moment marked the culmination of meticulous planning and coordination, executed with the precision and efficiency of elite special forces operations. The U.S. Special Forces efficiently cleared their designated target area in a tense sequence of events. Their precision and training were evident as they eliminated seven kidnappers, yet they found no hostages in that location. This moment sparked a brief, intense fear among the commanders that the hostages might have been moved. However, relief quickly washed over the operation team when the SAS commander's radio reported success. All four hostages were found alive and unharmed, and an additional four kidnappers had been neutralized. This news lifted the heavy weight of uncertainty, marking a significant victory for the rescue team. Immediately following the engagement, the teams conducted a thorough search of the deceased kidnappers for any intelligence and weapons. Simultaneously, medical personnel quickly assessed the hostages, ensuring they were unharmed from the firefight. The operation swiftly moved into its extraction phase. Helicopters were called to a nearby clearing, skirting the forest edge. Here, the four hostages, though exhausted, were safely evacuated. With the hostages aboard, the helicopters departed, heading back to ISAF headquarters in Kabul, concluding a tense yet ultimately successful rescue mission.